Hey, it's Tyler. Um, doing a late night video tonight. As you can tell, I've just gotten out of the shower. Uh, I hope the cricket in the background isn't too loud. They are in the house somewhere, and I think they're under the water heater because uh, they're impossible to find. And they stop making noise as soon as I walk back there. <laughs> Uh, Crap Phone suggested I talk about my experience with uh, playtesting for Wizards of the Coast and Paizo. And I thought, ooh, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, mainly because my NDA for both of those companies has expired. Uh, I haven't worked with either of those companies since uh, 2019. Um, they stopped doing a lot of in-person playtesting. Uh, and I have not been back to Washington State since then. So, um, a brief overview of the sort of differences in approach that both of these companies have to playtesting. I've only playtested for Paizo once, and that was at PaizoCon 2019. 2019 or 2018, I can't quite remember. Um, I've got this cool lanyard from it. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, did their playtest publicly. I, I'm sure, I'm positive they playtested internally as well before then, but effectively you paid for a convention ticket and got a bunch of crap, including the ability to go sit down at a table, you play a pre-made character, and, uh, you talk to them about game design. What's in common with these Wizards of the Coast is uh, much more professional, much more clinical. Um, they send out a thing, hey, we are, uh, you will get put on a, a list. There's various ways you can go about doing that. Occasionally they'll send uh, forms to game shops in Washington and go, hey, we, are, we need more playtesters. Here you go. That's how I uh, ended up on it. And then you'll get on a mailing list and they'll let you know whenever there's a uh, uh, a new playtest to be done. For Wizards of the Coast, I only ever did playtesting for Magic the Gathering. Uh, but I did uh, several surveys and pre-release uh, screenings of Dungeons & Dragons content. Most of which never got released, I don't think. I'll, n a note on that later. Um, so so there's, there's that to think about with the methodology. With one, it's general public, everyone's invited, as long as you're paying the, the, the door ticket, and you, uh, the, the game master running has enough space. With the other, they're explicitly paying for people who hopefully know about the gamer tested it's very very basic but wizards of the coast would ask you a few questions about the game to make sure you're not some rando off the streets that you know is yellow a color in magic the gathering a, a color of mana that sort of thing um so yeah that that's something i thought was strange about the way paizo did it in both cases, the player experience is, it's always going to be somewhat positive because there's that allure of, there's only, there's a very few amount of us that are getting this experience. Um, who knows what of this content is never going to see the light of day. Um, we get to have, you know, perhaps a direct hand over... Uh, over the game all of that can sort of override your um uh, they're having fans of the games uh, play test their games that's tricky right <laughs> they they're you're basically you know hiring a bunch of yes men to show up particularly with magic the gathering my main complaints with the game are financial but uh, the play test that feedback goes to the designers and the designers aren't really the problem with magic the gathering although there are issues there um 
I think in the four play tests I did for Wizards of the Coast, they implemented one suggestion, which is uh, there was a card that was at three mana, which uh, this was from the set Ixalan, the first one. Uh, I didn't play test for the second one. Uh, it two mana. Whenever you summon a, a Merfolk, it summoned a one one Merfolk with hexproof. That was really broken. That card at launch, uh, when it made it to full print, was three mana, and it was still really strong in saw play in pretty much every modern Merfolk deck. Um, I guess the the financials are the elephant in the room with both of these, right? Paizo's got the. Uh, the benefit of, you know, get, getting people to pay to come, which, you know, they give you so much free stuff, the, like, $15, $20 entry fee for that convention. It gave me, like, I think $80 worth of free crap, not including, you know, the subjective value of being a playtester. So, yeah, I, I guess they're paying you in, in stuff, or rather than Watsy treats it more like, you know, you're a contractor. They, they pay you like $150 to come play test. Both are very clinical. They're very clinical and very narrow in scope. You are only playing in the draft format in Magic the Gathering, or you're only playing a one-shot that this GM's run a dozen times or more already. Uh, you're playing it with pre-made characters. Uh, you're playing, you know, in Magic, you're playing with a 40-card deck. In, um, uh, in the tabletop RPGs, geez, sorry, <laughs> um, you're limited with the knowledge that you are there to test exactly what the system is capable of and not what the GM is capable of. So there's not a lot of looking at whether or not the system is a barrier to role play. You're pretty much just playing it as a board game. And that sort of, you know, with with Paizo's playtesting being at a convention, you'd expect it to get, you know, a looser atmosphere and, you know, maybe, you know, people would uh, re reveal their, their, their real, you know, Free your thoughts. They would be more glib. That's the word um, about how they felt about the game. But at the same time, there's this understanding that uh, you're not there to role play in the role playing game. You're there to test the game mechanics. So how do you get across to the designers that a mechanic is not good for role play? We could get across that there were balancing issues, like in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition playtest, uh, clerics were horrifically balanced. It was simultaneously, they were insanely boring to play, and if your party didn't have one, um, it was just an absolute meat grinder. It was impossible to get through even pretty easy encounters without having your whole party dead or dying. Uh, so there were balance issues that were solved. But did it fix the issue where playing anything in Pathfinder 2nd Edition feels very bland because balance was the focus? No, it, it didn't fix that at all. But, that you know, how do you explain that? How do you go, you need to start over? It has to start from ground zero. And I don't know at what phases Paizo brings in different playtesters. For example, in uh, Wizards of the Coast, when I playtested for them, I would playtest where the product's pretty much finished. They've got stuff at print, but the numbers are a little different than their final release. And I would playtest for Wizards of the Coast where they've literally got blank copy paper, double side taped onto magic cards that, you know, the artists have, uh, have inked on by hand and you've got the designers coming around going what do you think about this uh the this mechanic and the artists going around going okay well this is a new card type we haven't gotten this done how do you think you know because an artist for magic the gathering has to do double duty as a graphic designer the art of the card layout needs to inform um 
you know, where you need to look to get the relevant information, you know, your stats, you know, your eyes go from the, the text to the mana to the relevant stats in the bottom right, text in the center, etc. That's really interesting. That's a point where, you know, you're not afraid as a, as a play tester to go, that's a trash idea, I think you should scrap it, or that's a really good idea, I think you should follow that. With Paizo, if they're only doing playtesting once it's pretty much ready to show to the general public and you're not going to scare them off of your product, mm, are you running the risk of having too many, hmm, too many design decisions that nobody was uh, courageous enough to speak up and say, you know, let's not do this? And, you know, a lot of the designers of Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, they have tons of their own homebrew rules that they use to make the system more lethal, to make the, you know, lots of them, I can't remember who exactly, but, um, uh, you know, they say, oh, in our home games, we we just play 4th Edition. Um, but barring your, your specific thoughts on 4th Edition, doesn't that speak to issues internally with the company when the designers do not even like their own product. Um, when I was playtesting for Wizards of the Coast, they were all playing... Everybody who works there plays legacy formats. They don't play standard. And you've got um, Chris Pines on Twitter saying, I don't understand why people aren't playing standard. I just don't get it. And it's like, well... Ask any of the people that design for your game. They don't play standard. <laughs> you know, it's um, it's a paycheck. It's a day job. Because you talk to all these designers and they're super excited for many of these uh, design ideas that never make it to print. Because, I, I don't know. I, because the people at the top don't get it, I guess. Um, or in the case of Paizo you release it at a state where it's like, are you going to put the game through development hell and just go back and rewrite the whole thing? Because I just, I, I was sitting there at the play test trying to enjoy myself. You know, I didn't expect the role play to be good. It's a convention game. The role play is, there's never role play at a convention game. I've never seen it. If you have, let me know. That would be fascinating. Uh, but, you know, I was like, yeah, let's see what the evolution of Pathfinder is, right? Um, they've, you know, they've decided they need to make a second edition when they've always said they never were going to. All right, let, what, what do we have here? And I just sat there going, I don't... I don't see at the core what's worth a new 600-page core rulebook. To me, anyways. There are people who like second edition, ostensibly. I don't know any of them. <laughs> I don't know any of them that like second edition better than first edition, which is kind of the point. Um, so yeah, I, that, that's, that's kind of tricky to nail down my thoughts on playtesting specifically. But yeah, I just noticed that there's there's a lot of scattered ideas that get solidified internally and then uh, as a playtester you don't really know you know what can I do here at this point it seems too far gone or on the other end of things you do tell them something and it's just like ignored you know you never receive back a, a thing that's like thank you we took into account your feedback I just had to see the printed card and go hey I suggested that they nerf that or make it weaker in some way. Yeah. Although with Paizo doing it at the convention, something that was really cool is that all of the um, the designers would have a specific Q&A set aside. Whereas at Wizards of the Coast, the designers just kind of go table to table and have like a really short conversation with you, maybe at a very micro level on like a single mechanic. Um, but with Paizo, um, you know, I could go over and talk to Lisa Stevens for an hour. I could go over and um, 
you know, I, I paid 10 bucks to uh, have the dinner at the convention, and I didn't realize what they do if you have dinner at PaizoCon. Hopefully they have it offline again, guys. Don't... Uh, I, I know what Paizo is now, but, like, it's, you know, we, we don't have to worry about the coof anymore. <laughs> um... Have it in person again, because those in-person uh, conventions were phenomenal. They set it up to where you are sitting with an employee at the company. And so you're not just having, you know, a hotel convention dinner, which is good. You're having hotel convention dinner and talking with one of the people who are designing the game. Or in my case, uh, very interesting, I, I got to sit with uh, the uh, head of IT at the company and uh, listen to him talking about how, you know undoing their spaghetti code and totally redoing their back end and and why they don't have a thing like uh, D and D Beyond does, uh, because you know they're they're having to rebuild all that from the ground up. So I would say Paizo being a smaller company, they seem much more personable, but they make some more questionable decisions as far as how late they allow the playtesting. And Wizards of the Coast, their playtesting is just very micro-level, very clinical, and they, they sort of hyper-fixate too much on individual game design choices. And what does it matter if you've... In both cases, what does it matter if you've released a balanced product that people are not enjoying? Because balance is not the end-all, be-all of everything. So your playtesting... It needs to have a different outlook with tabletop RPGs. And with Magic the Gathering, the elephant in the room with Magic the Gathering is finance. Playtesters, at least for me, and I know a lot of the other playtesters, what we want to know is, what's it going to cost us? <laughs> you know, are, are, are you going to do something to control the price of the secondary market? And the response from Wizards of the Coast has been, no, we're going to make it consistently worse and worse and worse, and we're going to allow our stock to tank, and not really care about it. <laughs> so yeah, that's my experience playtesting. Um, rambly video, because I'm trying to remember stuff from years ago at this point, but... Obviously, I wasn't allowed to take notes on any of this. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Uh, let me know if you have any more specific questions that I can answer better. Uh, late night video as well. So, uh, thank you for being patient with me through this video. If you made it to the end, <laughs> thanks. See ya.